Good Lord. Okay, so today we're going to talk about basis sets, but before we get to that, we're going to talk about what problem basis sets solve. Okay, so imagine you have a system that has only four electrons, and we're going to restrict uh, the number of, uh, or of, of orbitals to six. So we're looking at how many ways you can uh, arrange four electrons in six orbitals. Now this is clearly your Hartree-Fock ground state, uh, two, two, two electrons in, in each level. If you allow single excitations, get 32 of those just by moving one electron into a higher level. If you consider double excitations, get a lot more of those. Triple excitations, even um, still further, and finally quadruple excitations. Now, this number has gone down from the number of triple excitations, but you can imagine that if we have an infinite size basis set, that, that, that this would continue going up. So altogether, we have about 500 oscillator determinants, and uh, each of these is uh, a member of the multi-electron basis sets, the number of Slater determinants available to expand the wave function. You, s you can start with just the Hartree-Fock determinant, and um, if you incorporate all of these, you're going to get to full CI. Now there's another dimension to this. If you weren't restricting your four electrons to just, uh, to just six levels, and instead gave them uh, a lot more room to play in, then um, then this is the one electron basis. Um, you've expanded the space available for the atomic orbitals to expand the molecular orbitals. You're going to get, going to get closer to the real shape. So if you go from just uh, two levels all the way up to infinite number of levels, this is, um, you're going to reach the Hartree-Fock limit, and this is the one electron basis. So um, the full multi-electron basis is going to recover all the correlation within a given one electron basis and the full one electron basis is going to recover uh, all of the SCF energy without any, any limitation on the shape of the molecular orbitals. So today, I'm going to talk about the one electron basis. And on Wednesday, Trent is going to talk about the multi-electron basis with uh, his talk on configuration interaction. So what is uh, one electron basis? Well, if you go both ways in both dimensions, you're finally going to solve the exact non-relativistic Schrodinger equation. So, uh, what is a basis set? Um, so, it is uh, any collection of shapes that you can put together in, in, in a linear combination. Yeah, these are usually uh, defined in, in 3D space. Um, and for convenience, we usually want them to be uh, orthogonal. And we put one, uh, one uh, function, one electron into each of them. This is this, uh, linear combination of atomic orbital, molecular orbital approximation that was in the previous lectures. Um, now there are many possible shapes. You can imagine that some would be very good, some would be very bad. Um, naturally, we want to, uh, we want to solve uh, the problem in as few uh, basis functions as possible, so we want to choose the very best shape. Um, now, there are several categories of very good shapes. Uh, physicists like to use just plane waves. Um, however, for um, that's not surprising since they often have, lo have long range and repetitive systems. Whereas for chemistry, we often deal with just single gas phase molecules, and so it doesn't make sense to have a basis function that expands over all space. Uh, some older programs use Slater functions, STOs, Slater-type orbitals, and we will look at their shape soon. Um, but most modern co quantum chemistry programs use Gaussian orbitals, G, Gaussian-type orbitals here. So a uh, Slater-type orbital looks something like this. This is the nucleus of, of um, this, this is a radial distribution of the electron density probably just electron, uh, about a single atom. So this is at the nucleus, this is at the sides. Um, this is as you go away from the nucleus. Um, this has both correct short range and long range behavior. So the short range means that this cusp is actually correct, and long range means that it's going, has the correct uh, asymptotic distribution. 
Um, and these are, in fact, correct for things like hydrogen atoms. The shape of Slater type orbitals has this form have a normalization constant and then x to x, y, and z to the a, b, and c um, powers respectively. a, b, and c control angular momentum, so the total, total angular momentum is simply the sum of a, b, and c. And the key shape determining factor is this e to the minus, minus zeta r, whose zeta is going to control the width of the orbital. A large zeta means that this is a very tight orbital, a small zeta gives a very diffuse function. Now, we can compare this functional form with that for a Gaussian type orbital. Same normalization constant, same x to the a, y to the b, z to the c. However, now this is an e to the minus zeta r squared. Um, angular momentum, again, controlled by a, b, and c. Width of the orbital, again, controlled by zeta. However, if you compare the Slater type, this red thing, with the Gaussian type, you see that, the sh that, 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 that this uh, shape is different. It doesn't have this cusp um, near r equals zero, and it falls off too quickly at large r. So this is no longer hydrogen atom-like, even for 1s. However, this, um, nevertheless, these Gaussian type orbitals are used almost universally by quantum chemists. And the reason for this is this Gaussian product theorem, um, which says that if product of a Gaussian type orbital, uh, a Gaussian and another Gaussian, is simply a third Gaussian. And this one product, um, and you'll recall from the Hardy Fock lectures, that there is a lot of multiplying together of, of, these, of these little orbitals. So this can, comes in very handy in the computation of integrals. And this is so advantageous compu uh, computationally that the quantum chemists are willing to throw out, um, are, uh, are willing to do almost anything to use Gaussian orbitals, even though they don't quite have this correct shape. What for one way to overcome this is to make a Gaussian type orbital look as much as possible like a Slater type orbital. So the Slaters are more accurate, but it takes longer to compute their integrals. So you uh, put together enough Gaussians in a linear combination, that's this CI, you're summing over a, Gaussian, a number of Gaussian type orbitals, so the little subscript I here, I here until they look like, um, and until you get this contracted Gaussian type orbital, and this looks a lot like a Slater type orbital. Um, and what, and the names of these contract, uh, combination of these Gaussians to mimic Slater type orbital is called, uh, often called an STONG. The one you'll see most often is STO3G. And so it's important to remember that that STO3G is not composed of Slater type orbitals. It's composed of Gaussian type orbitals that are arranged to look like a Slater type orbital. The way these uh, contracted Gaussians work, um, so here is the Slater distribution. If you take one Gaussian orbital, that would be this. It doesn't look at all like it, like the Slater. But if you, that's STO1G. If you put two of them together in STO2G, it's looking closer, and STO3G, which you may have heard a lot of, is closer still. Um, so we've gone from one wave, uh, one orbital to, th to three orbitals. So that would seem to be increasing the computational cost significantly um, because you have three coefficients as opposed to one coefficient. However, um, so if you optimized all these coefficients each time, that would be costly. However, these contracted Gaussians let you um, put all put these three together in a fixed ratio, and so it um, and so you're only optimizing a one one uh, coefficient. Um, and this is important because Hartree-Fock scales as n to the fourth. So you really want to minimize the the number of of, of, con of coefficients that you're optimizing. Um, it often happens that, uh, that these contracted Gaussians are used uh, for, for core type orbitals because you can pretty much predict what they're going to look like and it's not so important that, that, that they change in response to the chemical environment. So you have contracted orbitals for the inner shells 
and uh, individual Gaussians for the outer shells. Yeah, one, um, we need a convenient way to, to, to refer to the size of, of a basis set. Uh, a minimal basis set, uh, so this is beryllium, yes, um, 1s, 2s, and you add a set of two p's, so that is two sets of s orbitals, one set of p orbitals, uh, 1s, 2s, 3p, that gives you a total of five orbitals. Um, have four electrons, and so four of these are considered, uh, four electrons go into two orbitals, these are considered occupied, and the remaining three are virtual. This is a case where this minimal basis set, where you have one basis function for each atomic orbital in each atom. Um, the next step is a double zeta basis set, where you have two basis functions for each atomic orbital. So you double the 2s1p, and you get uh, 4s2p, or 10 orbitals. Same number uh, occupied, but we've uh, significantly increased the virtual space. Um, this increase of the virtual space uh, allows the orbital to get bigger or smaller when other atoms approach it, that is, actually respond to the chemical environment. And so it adds uh, flexibility. It can uh, point along bonds and such, and you get a, uh, a a, a far more accurate calculation with a double zeta basis set than with just the minimal. A triple zeta, uh, usually marked as TZ, has three basis functions for each type of atomic orbital. So once again, you add another set of five, and now you have 15 total in triple zeta, and so on up the scale for quadruple zeta, five triple zeta, six triple zeta. The last one we're going to show here is 20. Okay. Now, um, the core electrons in an in, in actual chemical environment, the core electrons aren't going to be changing so much. It is only the, uh, the valence electrons are far more important. So it's far more important to have flexibility for valence electrons than for the core electrons. So a split valence basis set is one that allows uh, flexibility for the valence electrons, but not so much for the core electrons. So if we can compare these. Uh, We've seen the minimal basis set for the for, for plain double zeta. Minimal basis set is uh, this is the the one s orbital, and then um, we're going to keep adding sets for the two s two p. So at double zeta, where uh, this has ten, um, you're only adding two of this part, and so there's only nine savings of one orbital. Triple zeta, you get a savings of these two orbitals quadruple zeta, you get a savings of three orbitals. Now, this is not so dramatic for beryllium, but if you go f significantly higher in the periodic table and more electrons are considered core beyond simply 1s, then the difference between uh, a, full a full double zeta and a split valence double zeta is going to become more important. So this is one of the ways we can reduce the basis set size. Okay, occupancy. Um, going to uh, address a few ways in this talk that your quantum chemistry program can fail to give you the answers that you expect. And one of these is occupancy. Uh, quantum chemistry programs that can use symmetry um, often can have, uh, will, will, will give you valuable efficiency gains. If you have a point group of order two, I um, thought that was one over point group order squared. Um, anyway, uh, things can be far, far, uh, far more efficient if you use uh, symmetry. However, um, you have to have a good initial guess because once you uh, allocate electrons to each of the point groups, for instance, uh, these four in uh, C2V, then because there aren't any coupling between each subgroup in the orbitals, then um, then that orbital occupation is going to remain throughout, unless your program is very smart. So if you uh, start off with an incorrect guess, you're going to end up with an incorrect answer, uh, because what you've effectively done is calculated an excited state rather than a ground state energy. So SCF energies are never going to match the ground state because you have an excited state. 
And if you do a frequency analysis, then you're also not going to match. Then you also, also may have imaginary frequencies because you haven't, um, because you're, you're, you're not computing a surface that corresponds to um, the one that you're after. Uh, the larger the base set, the more likely this is going to happen. And um, even if you specify the basis set, if you do this uh, naively and don't pay attention to the uh, order, uh, to the order of these four groups, then you can still get an incorrect answer. So the way to do this, uh, to alleviate this problem, is uh, usually to simply run a, uh, run a calculation with a very small basis set. STO3G will usually get it right, and then specify um, that resulting uh, occupancy when you run a calculation with a larger basis set. Okay, so so far we've just covered um, space for, um, space in the basis set uh, to to um, for uh, atoms, which usually you know have a good amount of spherical sy symmetry about them. However, as soon as you put an atom in a chemical environment, for instance, this hydrogen in HCN, um, the electrons are going to want to be more um, are going to want to form a chemical bond to be to be more um, in this region. And if all of your basis functions are spherically symmetric, then that is then then that shape is not available to them. So the uh, so the way to uh, alleviate this is to add uh, basis functions of a higher angular momentum. So you can imagine that if, that if we add uh, a set of p orbitals, which are going to look like this, to a hydrogen, then suddenly it can distort um, as it needs to um, in, order to, in, or, um, uh, in order to form this bond. So we're allowing greater flexibility. Um, the name for such functions is usually uh, polarization functions. Um, and uh, so S functions usually uh, are polar, uh, you can, uh, are allowed to be polarized when you add the presence of P functions, as for hydrogen. And P functions can polarize if they're mixed with D functions, like for heavier atoms. Uh, so if you have a function of angular momentum L, mi mix it with basis set functions of L plus one, and you have some polarization. Uh, this gives a polarized double zeta or double zeta plus polarization basis sets. And these are very important. It's not too often that you'll be using a basis set that doesn't have polarization functions. Once again, there is a pitfall in this. You'll recall from your, uh, from your uh, PCHEM class that there are five d orbitals, that they look something like this. Each looks pretty distinct. However, it, um, computers are going to prefer to work with six d orbitals, um, which are called the Cartesian d functions as opposed to pure angular momentum d functions. Uh, so they look like this, and the, sum, and, and the sixth one just looks like a big, um, um, just looks like an s orbital. So you're just adding minimally to the shape that it, to, to the shape that your um, uh, molecular orbitals can be expanded into. Uh, the answers, if the program is run with 5D or 6D orbitals, are going to look very alike. However, as soon as you add that that sixth D function, you're giving uh, your wave function more room to expand, so the energy is going to be slightly lower. Um, and they're close enough that you can often run, run, run into trouble if you don't recognize that, that this is what is going on. So for D functions, there can be five or six. For F functions, the proper number is seven, but computers often like to run with 10. Um, now, which, which of these answers is correct? It's different for different basis sets. The author of a basis set is going to design, um, is going to design the basis set uh, to work with one or the other. The quantum chemistry program is either going to always default to one or always to default to the proper one for that basis set. Um, so if you're using just a plain basis set, you, you might be all right. Um, however, if you start tweaking the basis set, um, if you say, I want this basis set 
but let me add this function to it. The, program, the quantum chemistry program may entirely forget which one the basis set ought to be. So uh, you need to be careful of um, um, that the number of basis functions is adding up the way it ought. You can, um, any quantum chemistry program will print the total number of basis functions and it is well within your power to count up how many there should be for each, uh, for, for, for the system in question. Um, and if anything is going, in, if anything in your answer is suspect, this is a good thing to, to pay attention to. Um, if you get it, if things are looking suspicious, read the manual to figure out how to specify it correctly. Okay, so we've covered polarization functions. Now we're going to cover diffuse functions. Um, when the electron density exists far from the electron, f from far from the nuclear centers, uh, normal basis uh, sets uh, aren't, um, aren't in that space in order to cover that shape. Um, diffu one can add diffuse functions to, uh, to their basis set. And these are functions that have a small zeta, and so they hold the electron far from the nucleus. Imagine that this would be important for anions. This is hydrogen. This is uh, an exaggeration of what the hydrogen anion would look like. And you can see that this would be greatly improved by very fluffy functions. Uh, diffuse functions are necessary for anions. Uh, Rydberg states, electronegative atoms like fluorine. Um, they're also important for Van der Waals complexes in order because uh, these are far away, and so they're going. Um, monomers are far away, so they're going to need uh, some fluffy functions around. Um, and this is one way in which your quantum chemistry calculation can go very wrong. If you actually need these func need diffuse functions and don't have them, you can get uh, qualitatively incorrect answers. So in this step, we're adding functions with valence angular momentum, not higher angular momentum like for polarization functions. But, and, but with smaller than valence exponents. Yet another pitfall. Um, as you go to larger and larger basis sets, uh, particularly large basis sets that have diffuse functions in them, these are prone to near linear dependency. Um, so th your description of the space fan spanned by the basis functions is overcomplete. And um, this will often cause your quantum chemistry program to simply stop if it is MOLPRO, or to be slow to converge or behave uh, erratically. Um, a linear dependency is diagnosed just from, the over, ju just from the eigenvalues of the overlap matrix. And once it's diagnosed, you can simply toss out uh, project out and then toss out the extraneous functions. Uh, so if your SCF is having problems converging, um, or you're dealing with a potential energy curve in which you might like each point along the curve to, um, to, to use exactly the same basis set, then you'll want to make sure that the same number of atoms, uh, same number of orbitals are being tossed out in each step. So either tighten up the cutoff value for projecting out linear dependencies or adjust it um, so that the same number of orbitals are dropped along the curve. Um, and thus the potential curve will be smooth and you won't have little jagged edges when uh, extra orbitals fall in and out. Okay, there, um, so we've talked about basis sets in general so far. Now we're going to meet a few of them. This was a list I found on the internet, a partial listing by someone who was really annoyed with basis set acronyms. Um, People have good reason to be annoyed with, annoyed with basis set acronyms because they are uh, everywhere. Um, so these are just a few basis sets. And fortunately, uh, they don't look as crazy as, as, as they do in this listing because there is a lot of, uh, of regimentation in, the, uh, in their names. And you can actually determine a lot just from the name. So, First, uh, Popel style basis sets. Uh, these were developed by John Popel um, and popularized by the Gaussian program. Uh, basis set notation looks like this, which may look very strange. Um, the key identifier is that there's a capital G 
towards the end. Um, now there's uh, three, uh, three regions of this name. This K-NLM is going to be for the core and valence functions. This plus or stuff in parentheses after the G is for polarization functions. Sorry, the star or stuff after the G is for polarization functions. And pluses uh, represent diffuse functions. So we'll start with the K-NLM. Um, this, these will be f uh, uh, basis sets in this style, 321G or 6311G. The first number tells how many uh, primitive Gaussian type orbitals are for the core functions. So the difference between 321G and, six and 631G is how well the core orbitals are described. Uh, the N is the number of primitive Gaussian types for the inner valence, L for medium valence, and M for out of valence. And once you get beyond these, beyond these sort of toy basis sets, uh, pretty much all you're going to see for N, L, and M are 3, 1, as in 6, 3, 1, G, and 3, 1, 1, as in 6, 3, 1, 1, G. So 6, uh, so six 3, 1 is, uh, is pretty much a double zeta, split valence double zeta. Uh, type uh, quality basis set, and 6311G is a uh, approximate triple zeta quality basis set. It's, r it's rather small for a triple zeta size. So polarization functions, these go after the capital G. Um, a star indicates one set of depolarization functions added to the heavy atoms. Um, so this is going to have a set of d orbitals added to things like carbon. The second star indicates, um, uh, additionally indicates one set of p polarization functions added to hydrogen. Um, so star star is going to have a set of polarization functions on all atoms. And star star is completely equivalent to d comma p. If you need to add more polarization functions, you just add more things in the uh, parentheses. So this could be 6311G 3DF comma 2PD, which is really packing on the polarization functions. Uh, for diffuse functions, these stick with pluses. Uh, plus, one plus indicates one set of P diffuse functions added to the heavy atoms, that's this position, and the second plus indicates you're adding diffuse functions um, to a uh, set of S diffuse functions to the hydrogen atoms. Uh, so, and these can of course all be married together, 6311 plus plus G star star, which by the way is a very awful basis set to use for benzene. So these are the Pobel style basis sets, look for the capital G. Um, more common in our work at least are Dunning style basis sets. So the Pobel style basis sets were generally optimized from hartree fock calculations on atoms and small molecules, but when you are um, performing uh, calculations with higher order methods, couple cluster theory, MP2, configuration interaction, um, you might want, uh, th these are still more expensive, scaling as n to the fifth to n to the eighth, for instance, and so you really want to minimize the number of basis set functions, and one way to do this is to actually use basis sets that have been optimized to recover this correlation energy. So. Um, Tom Dunning used higher order correlation methods um, to uh, optimize his basis sets, and thus these are called correlation consistent. And as correlation consistent translates to lowercase c, lowercase c, which is the mark of a Dunning basis. Um, even uh, more importantly than using uh, correlated calculations, um, Dunning basis sets were designed to systematically converge to the basis set limit. So they're going to look like uh, CCPVXZ, where there's an X equals D for double zeta, T for triple zeta, and so on. These have been defined pretty much up to, up to six zeta regularly, and there's a few seven zeta and eight zeta for very specialized uses. Um, the simplest uh, basis set is going to look like CCPVXZ, or here, this is the simplest triple zeta basis set, CCPVTZ. And this has both the core and valence electrons, but also it has polarization electrons, polarization 
uh, functions built in. There is no extra tacking things on for polarization functions. Uh, functions are added in shells so that all uh, orbitals with a similar contribution to the energy are added together. So for carbon, CCPVDZ is 3S2P1D, triple zeta, 4S3P2D1F, quadruple zeta, um, this, uh, and so on. This, this, this is a very regular pattern in building up the basis sets. Diffuse functions are functions for every angular momentum present. Um, and this is indicated by adding an aug out in front of this. So for carbon, you can see S, P, and D, um, CCPVDZ has a diffuse S set of S, P, and D orbitals. You can keep on going higher. Extra diffuse functions are available with double E aug, triple E aug, and so forth. Um, these are the style basis sets that we most often use. However, if you actually want to incorporate correlation of core orbitals, then um, there are a set of basis functions that have this extra capital C in them that actually have core correlation functions. So these are the two uh, most widely used families of basis sets, but there are plenty of others. The uh, atomic natural orbital, ANO, basis sets uh, developed by Amloff and Taylor. Um, these are designed to reproduce natural orbitals from CISD calculations on atoms. Um, they are generally contracted, which I won't go into, but it's a way that for it to have computational savings while still having many uh, basis functions. Um, these are very large basis sets and the, consequently they're very expensive, but they exist for most all atoms, and there are uh, uh, numerous uh, levels of truncation available. So you can form basically any size basis set you want from the ANOs. People have also developed uh, basis sets just for properties. Uh, Satellite is one that you'll see pretty often. Um, so if you basically just have to look up and see if there's anything particularly good for your for whatever role you're seeking. Another uh, way to cut down on basis functions is to use uh, pseudo potentials. So we've already said that core, core orbitals are generally not um, are generally not changing in a calculation but as you go down the periodic table those electrons can really add up. Um, and so one might want a way to ignore all of the core electrons and just run your quantum cal chemistry calculation on the valence electrons that are of chemical interest. So if your wave function looks like this uh, dotted blue line, um, one way to do this is to get a, um, is to treat all this with a pseudopotential and then just have your, and then just have your basis sets uh, cover this valence region of the, of the calculation. This leads to much greater efficiency since you're not filling, uh, dominating your calculation with all sorts of uh, integrals that aren't actually going to improve the, the quantum chemical result. Uh, this can incorporate relativistic effects, which are important for those heavier atoms. Um, the way you do this is to remove the core dominated basis functions Put, put in a pseudopotential and then just re-optimize the remaining basis functions. So you'll often have to have a basis set and a pseudopotential together and uh, you'd better find the ones that are paired because that basis set is only designed to be used with the pseudopotential. Um, this is very important for heavy atoms, especially transition atoms and uh, even more so for uh, lanthanides and actinides. So how do you actually get a basis set? Hopefully the ones that you'll be using are available within whatever quantum chemistry program you're after. Um, but if not, then EMSL is the place to go. It's, the website looks like this. Uh, you can search EMSL on, uh, on Google or whatever. Then you just search by the basis set name. Uh, these little arrows show up for um, whatever atoms are available in this basis set. Choose the correct quantum chemistry program that you're going to use, because quantum chemistry is so fractured that of course we can't specify the same thing in the same way for each program. Everyone has a different uh, format. Um, so this, and you can get both basis sets and pseudo potentials here. So 
So for instance, double OGCCPVDZ, or uh, for carbon, or for hydrogen, right, this is just CCPVDZ, um, you'll recall that this was just a 2S, 1P, and indeed shows two sets of S orbitals, one set of P orbitals. Um, these are the zetas, and these are the contractions. So for something like this, um, altogether this forms one set of orbitals, but for a set like this, you have to add up uh, S orbitals with these three zetas in these proportions. Carbon is going to have 3S, 2P, 1D for CCPVDZ, and indeed you see 3S, 2P, and 1D here. Then just look in the manual to see how to specify this in your actual calculation. Okay. Um, one topic that is uh, relevant to basis sets is basis set superposition error. If you're doing an um, and in term a dissociation curve, like this is shown for argon. Uh, the black here is the reference. Um, the way to compute this um, is to take the dimer, argon 2, uh, that energy, and subtract out the energy of the two monomers, um, as is shown right here. However, in the dimer calculation, because the basis set isn't complete, um, electrons on this monomer are going to be borrowing some, uh, some density, not density, are going to be borrowing some, uh, some space to expand from electrons on this monomer. Um, then when you do the monomer calculation, those basis functions aren't there. Um, and this gives rise to uh, the way to alleviate this problem is to use the counterpoise uh, correction of Boys and Bernardi. Uh, this involves placing uh, ghost atoms. Uh, this, the dimer calculation is done precisely the same way, but for the monomer calculation, um, you have all the same basis functions present as in the dimer calculation, um, not just those that belong to the monomer. That's shown by this AB basis set as opposed to the individual A and B basis set. Since the dimer energy is always the same, um, the counterpoise corrected is going to be uh, not, not so deep. Um, this uh, problem is going to be mainly with smaller basis sets. So as you increase the basis set size, you don't have to worry about this so much. Okay. So how do um, basis sets actually perform? Um, here are some graphs for uh, frequencies and bond lengths for some very small molecules. Um, this is at double zeta, triple zeta, quadruple zeta, and this is looking at error. So you'd like all of these to converge to zero, which they do at very high zeta. Um, you can tell that things are starting to straighten up around triple zeta, but that double zeta uh, is, is um, not so good. And this is often the case. Everything becomes much nicer at triple zeta. Uh, so same for bond lengths, um, they're getting quite close at triple zeta and rather far off at double zeta. Um, you might think that uh, a bigger basis set is always better. So um, if, you can own, if, if you can afford Hartree-Fock, um, perhaps um, if you have a Hartree-Fock double zeta calculation, perhaps you'd be better off going to a Hartree-Fock quadruple zeta calculation. However, there, um, uh, this isn't exactly so. One must balance the basis sets. Uh, one must balance methods and basis sets. So this is shown here. Um, what these graphs are is a distribution of error uh, for the given method and basis set. We like these, these distributions to be very sharp, like this, and centered around this zero error line. So you can tell that Hartree-Fock gives a wide range of errors. Uh, mid, uh, mean is about here. However, as you move to higher basis sets, this, the, the mean is actually moving far, farther from the zero line. 
for MP2, um, double zeta is definitely inferior to triple zeta. And for CCSD parent T, again, triple zeta is far better. And um, you s would scarcely ever want to use double zeta. So, uh, so sadly, it seems that hartree falk it's most appropriate to use smaller basis sets. And as you go up, it's better to use larger basis sets. So actually, the base best basis set to use for couple cluster is triple zeta or quadruple zeta. Um, that was not very well explained. Um, as the number of basis sets, as the number of basis set functions increases, we might hope that it approaches the basis set limit. That would be something that looks like this. Small basis set, um, the e energy is here, larger basis set, it's here, and so forth. Now, the, uh, uh, the function, many methods uh, actually have a functional form for this curve. Um, and so it is convergence with respect to basis set size is very slow. And it's impossible to actually go very high along this scale. So one would hope that given a couple points along here, that you can actually predict the complete basis set limit. Um, one important uh, requisite for this is that you have a hierarchical set of basis sets. So this is where the, the Dunning um, sets come in, as opposed to the Popel sets. So uh, if you have a couple points, then you can try to perform a basis set extrapolation. So you choose two angular, mo um, angular momentum uh, adjacent basis sets, like CCPVTZ and CCPVQZ, and um, extrapolate the Hartree-Fock and the correlation energy separately. So uh, your, your CBS estimate of CCSD parent T is going to be two terms, hartree fock CBS and the correlation CBS. Um, there are a number of different schemes out there for doing this, ex for, for doing the, this extrapolation. Um, this is the one that we often use, this exponential form. Um, if at all possible, you should avoid double zeta when you're choosing these two angular momentum adjacent basis sets because, um, it, because that can be rather erratic. Yes, here we go. Okay, so these is those same types of error distribution curves again, um, only now using uh, extrapolations. So here is the, that's the zero line. Here's the extrapolation with double zeta and triple zeta. Here's a three-point extrapolation, double, triple, quadruple. Uh, four-point extrapolation, five-point extrapolation. If we stick with just two-point extrapolations, this is double zeta, this, this is, sorry, this is double triple, this is triple quadruple, and you can see that things are shaping up far better. This is quadruple quintuple, uh, better still, and even at the best is a uh, 5z, 5z, 6z extrapolation. So you can see what I mean about avoiding double zeta basis sets if you can. Um, a, this two-step extrapolation is excellent when you can actually do this second step at a very good correlated method like CCSD parent T. Um, so if you could get CCSD parent T at triple zeta and quadruple zeta, that would be excellent. But this is often impossible. And, uh, <coughs> if you do, um, and just doing MP2 alone isn't the best. So what we often do in this group is to have uh, is to do the Hartree-Fock extrapolation, do a CBS extrapolation of just MP2, and then add on this delta CCSD parent T correction, um, which is uh, simply the difference in CCSD parent T and MP2 at correlation energies evaluated at a smaller basis. <coughs> um, so. Uh, M a hartree fock and MP2 use the larger basis set and then use a smaller basis set to recover the correlation between, um, to recover the correlation from couple cluster. Um, and these CVS limit things are, are quite effective. Okay, 
Some other basis sets that you might uh, hear floating around our lab, at least, are the months basis sets of uh, Trular. So uh, if you consider first CCPVXZ and AugCCPVXZ, the difference between these is simply uh, the set of diffuse functions that are added to heavy atoms and to hydrogen and, and helium. Um, now here is plotted for adenine thymine the, uh, the difference in basis set size. And you can see that there's quite a gap between triple zeta and aug triple zeta, quadruple zeta and aug quadruple zeta. And um, this gap becomes even more dramatic when you look at performance. So um, not performance, wall time. Um, so this is, so the augmented takes over four times longer than the unaugmented just for triple zeta. Uh, one way uh, of having a basis set in, in, in size between these that's been around for a while is using heavy aug, um, where all the diffuse functions are locked off hydrogen and, and helium and kept on the heavy atoms. So this adds a few extra points along here. Um, Trular, uh, Papajak and Trular uh, looked at this and saw a calendar. Uh, for aug, they thought August. So for heavy aug, they call this July, and went on down the series so that um, at each possible step, they lopped off the highest angular momentum basis function, uh, set of basis functions from the heavy atoms until they got down to SP, which they always kept. So this way you can get June, May, and so on. So from this, you can get a family of basis sets that you have but uh, basically a choice of any size. And, um, <coughs> and as far as wall time, you can imagine that if this calculation, which is still uh, has augmented with diffuse functions, does as well as this, then you have a dramatic uh, uh, savings as far as time. And this can be seen for, uh, for B3 lip uh, with um, a set, the S22 set of intramolecular interactions. Uh, if you look just at these black bars, that's the error. Um, so you want this to be as close as possible to the zero line. So this is for double zeta and this is for triple zeta. And you can see that having these months basis sets is not hurting things much. <coughs> <coughs> not hurting things much at all. Um, now, just as a note for intramolecular interactions, this is um, hydrogen bonding systems. You can see that all they need are some sort of uh, diffuse functions, whereas if you just use CCPVDZ or CCPVTZ, their errors are far larger. Whereas for, uh, for dispersion bound systems, they really like are any triple zeta basis as opposed to a double zeta. OK, so finishing up. Um, We've uh, determined that a bigger basis set is not always better. You need to match the basis set to the method. Hartree-Fock is decent with double zeta, but if, you use, if you're using coupled cluster, you can want uh, triple or quadruple zeta. Um, STO3G should not be used, except for sort of uh, uh, test calculations or to, or to determine uh, occupancy. Um, anions and uh, non-covalent interactions uh, need diffuse functions. Uh, if you're choosing between Dunning, Dunning and Popel basis sets, they're about the same for double zeta. Um, however, um, getting into the Dunnings, CCPVTZ, is going to be much better than the uh, respective Popel triple zeta. Um, base uh, ab initio results are always going to converge uh, terribly slowly for, for non-DFT methods. Um, that's why uh, one often uses extrapolations, CBS extrapolations, and those delta corrections of that sort. Um, however, DFT is less dependent on basis set size than wave function methods. And you're often as good as you're going to get just by triple zeta. Yeah.